you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry.
Yesterday, I was uh, reading, uh, this is about the third time that I've read this particular book, Love Does by Bob Goff. I mentioned it last week. What a great book, and he just has really neat stories, and I'm going to share a portion of one of his stories this morning in the message I'm bringing. But I thought as I was reading, I thought, you know, I think I'll, I've got Audible, and I think I'll download the Audible version of Love Does because it's a kind of book that you can just read over and over again or listen to over and over again, and it, every time it has, a, it has an impact. You know, there will be something that he says in a story that just connects with you all over again. And so I went, I went um, on my phone and, and looked it up, and lo and behold, there was a new book by Bob Goff. There's several new ones, but there was a new one there, and it, it's what God was leading me to. I didn't know when I thought, I'll download Love Does, God said, I've got something different for you. And I downloaded Bob Goff's book, Undistracted. It's one of his new books. And I listened to the foreword in the first chapter, and I said, Lord, you knew how much I need this right now. The devil will do everything he can to distract us. Amen? And um, he'll, he'll, put our, he'll put our eyes on what's wrong instead of what's good. And no wonder Paul wrote to the Philippian church and said, uh, if you're thinking on things, think on the good things. Think about the blessings. Think about uh, the, the many positive things that God is bringing to your life. And so as I listened to the first chapter of Undistracted by Bob Goff, I thought, Lord, thank you for this, and thank you for the way that you're going to use it in my life uh, to, to help me to keep my eyes on you. Um, I don't know about you, but life just tries to pull my eyes off of Jesus all the time. And I, I need that undistracted uh, blessing that he wants to bring to my life. Well, we're always making plans. And sometimes the things we plan, we get to, and sometimes we don't. Agree? You ever made a, a, just a really well-laid plan, and then you got down the road and you thought, man, I forgot all about that. I need to get back to that. I remember one time a preacher came to Columbia to preach a revival, and in one of his messages he talked about how we are partners with God, and he said we need to plan our work, but then we need to work our plan. You ever heard that before? Plan your work and work your plan. And so we're always planning all the time. Uh, right now there are a lot of people who are doing vacation planning. Some of you have already been on vacation. If you haven't been, you've been on there looking at, hotel reservations or flights or, or excursions, different things. Some people are planning to go on a cruise or just came back off of a cruise. We got four people over here just went to Alaska, and they said they took pictures, and then they deleted them because it didn't even compare to what they were really seeing. Um, and so a lot of planning going into having times away, and those are important times. Educational planning is taking place. Um, Next month, Matthew, my son-in-law, is going to go spend the night uh, with Rachel at USC in Columbia, and they're going to go through orientation, and there's all kinds of things that are going to be, y'all, Rachel's already there. She's 18 years old. She keeps telling them what Tommy used to tell me, you know, I'm 18, and I'm an adult now. I'm an adult. And so Rachel's already there. She's making plans, and, and uh, Landon Stevens is going over to Columbia this year, and he's making plans, and all this stuff is happening. All, all these different young folks that graduated this year, they're making plans, and that's good stuff. And those who, uh, uh, who have um, graduated college are making career plans, and that's all a part of life. And continuing to make pro progress from week to week. And then there's financial planning. There's financial planning for young families. They're planning how to, how to help the kids get through college so that they don't end up so far in debt that they'll never be able to get out. Uh, and and there's, there's people who are making financial planning for retirement years and for taking care of all of the different things that are associated with that. And here's the thing about planning. It's important, but your plans can be interrupted in a second. And that's the part that nobody can plan for, right? I mean, you can think that you have everything just exactly as it ought to be, and then something happens, and it takes you down a completely different road that you never anticipated that you'd be traveling. I'll never forget one day I was visiting one, with one of our uh, elderly ladies in the church, um, and her, her husband had just retired. They had prepared well for retirement. 
Um, they were looking forward to traveling and to all of the things that they had uh, saved for and that they had put things in place for. And then he was overtaken with an unexpected uh, physical illness and they never got to execute those plans. And I never forget sitting with her one day as tears rolled down her cheeks and she said, all of the stuff we plan to do, now we're not going to be able to do. And that happens. Lord, help us to plan as though we have many tomorrows, but then, Lord, give us the grace that when life happens, we might be able to navigate that pathway that he has for us. Well, that, that's all I'm going to say about that because that's a different message. But what I want to talk to you about today is the truth that is, that is announced um, in a passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Paul writes, Behold! Exclamation point. Listen! Is what he's saying. Listen! I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We, in other words, we shall not all die physically, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead, those who have fallen asleep, physically speaking, those who are in the grave, will be raised up imperishable, and so we will all be changed. Jesus offered a parable during his days of ministry on this earth about ten virgins, five wise virgins and five foolish virgins. And it was their responsibility to keep the lamp burning at night. And in order to keep the lamp burning at night, they had to make preparation. They had to plan to have enough oil on hand that the lamp would not go out. And so there were five wise virgins who had planned appropriately and their lamps were burning bright in the darkness of midnight. The five foolish virgins got tied up in whatever was happening and did not pay attention to the responsibility to have oil, surplus oil on hand, and their lamps went out in the midnight. And so they went out in the darkness looking for oil at a most inopportune time and while they were gone looking for oil, the master showed up. And so they were in the darkness and not prepared for his return in that moment that he made the return. And Jesus said, the Son of Man will come at an hour that you do not expect him. Make sure that you're ready for his appearing. Keep your lamp burning. In other words, keep living in that fellowship with him that makes your life the bright life that God wants it to be. One day, the plans of men and women and young people will come to a screeching halt. That's the truth. Bill Gaither expressed it well in an old song. The marketplace is empty. No more traffic in the streets. All the builders' tools are silent. No more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors. In the courtroom, no debate. Work on earth is all suspended. Get that, is all suspended as the king comes through the gate. One day, and we may live to see it, or we may be called back from the grave because of it, but one day, the Bible says, there will be a blast on the trumpet, and an angel will give a shout, and Jesus will appear in the clouds. And the Bible says that when he comes again, every eye will behold him, Revelation 1-7, even those who have pierced him which is a way of saying to us whether you are serving the Lord and following Jesus or have rejected the Lord and going your own way, you will know it is Him. And you will know that He has returned. And when that happens, all of the plans of man will come to a screeching halt. That is the truth. 
You won't wonder what's happening because the Bible says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Now listen to this. Not just every believer, but every person will bow in his presence. Those who are serving him will bow in adoration. Those who are not serving him will bow in terror. Because when he returns, there is no more opportunity for repentance. It's the end of the dispensation of grace when Jesus returns. That, that's why the Bible says that if you feel the Lord pulling your heart to him, if you feel this wooing of the Holy Spirit to come into the fellowship of Jesus, now is the day. Now is the time. Don't be numbered among those five who were out looking for oil, and then he came. Make sure, make sure that Jesus is the Savior and the Lord of your life. Make sure today. I know preachers have been preaching this for, for eons. I, I know that. It does not change the fact that one day it will happen. My mama got sick in a flash, it seemed like to us. And a month later, she drew her last breath. She was so sick in that month that we were praying, Lord, if mom's not going to be healed, let mom go home. And mom went home. And I'm, I'm glad. But let me tell you something. For our family, everything changed when mom went home. Everything changed. Our plans changed. The way we gather as a family has changed. The way we interact with each other has changed. And the Apostle Paul says, I'm, I'm telling you a mystery. Not everybody's going to die before Jesus comes back, but know this, when he comes back, in the twinkling of an eye, we will all be changed. One day a trumpet will sound. One day the clouds will part. One day Jesus will make his appearance. One day everything will be changed in a moment. The Bible says some people will try to flee from his presence while others run to fall at his feet. <laughs> The Bible says the dead in Christ will rise from every graveyard and every corner of the earth. Can you imagine? And so whatever our plans, whatever our conquest, whatever our struggles, heaven is on the horizon. Do you get that? Heaven is on the horizon. And so Bob Goff, in his book, Love Does, Andy, I'll always thank you for introducing me to his books. Um, he tells about a trans-Pacific trip on a sailboat with five of his friends, and they set out from Los Angeles to Hawaii on a 35-foot sailboat. Now, that sounds big. If you're going to Santee, that's a big old boat. But if you get out on the Atlantic, <laughs> you're going to feel like you are in a John boat. And so these, these uh, six young fellows set out to be a part of the Trans-Pac race, Trans-Pacific race. And so they, they knew that navigation is going to become important because when you're going from Los Angeles to Hawaii, and you got the whole Pacific Ocean out there. I mean, just think about that. You get off just a little bit, and you keep getting off just a little bit, 
and you're going to be in Japan before you know it. You're going to pass, you're going to pass Hawaii. So they recruited a young fellow who was going to take leave who had navigation skills. He was in the Navy stationed down at San Diego. And so this guy is said, yeah, man, I'm in. I'll take leave. I'll go with you. I'll bring my sextant and that instrument that you look at and you line it up with certain constellations in the sky and it'll help you realize what direction is true north and then you find out what your bearing is on the map. You know, is where is that island? Where is that? That, that port that we're going to in Hawaii, and so you just keep, you, keep, you keep track and you keep moving in that direction. A week before they left, the guy said, I've been deployed, I can't take leave, I can't go. Bob Goff said he went down to the local sporting goods store and he um, started looking for a sextant. He found a plastic one. <laughs> He said, I've got some charts, and I couldn't understand what I was looking at. He said, I had a book that was basically navigation for dummies. And he said, I'm going through this thing and thinking, oh, man, we are in trouble. And he found a guy on aisle three and said, do you know anything about this? And this guy was just, he was a nerd about navigation, okay? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, man, let me show you how that works. And so he said, I got, a, I got like a 15-minute tutorial on aisle three of the sporting goods store and he said I was the navigator and so they get on this boat and they take off and um, sure enough sure enough uh, with a lot of a lot of maneuvering and a lot of mistakes on the way uh, they ended up sailing in uh, to the port 16 days from the time that they left Los Angeles uh, they ended up at Diamond Head and they said it was in the darkness uh, that they went into Diamond Head. I think it was early hour uh, darkness. And he said the silence was broken by a booming voice over a loudspeaker announcing the, the name of our tiny boat. Now I'm going to read what he says. Somehow the way he said it, we sounded like we were the size of an aircraft carrier. Then he started announcing the names of our ragtag crew like he was introducing heads of state. One by one, he announced all our names with obvious pride in his voice, and it became a really emotional moment for each of us on board. When he came to my name, he didn't talk about how few navigation skills I had or the zigzag course I'd led us on to get there. He didn't tell everyone I didn't even know which way north was or about all my other mess-ups. Instead, he just welcomed me in from the adventure like a proud father would. When he was done, there was a pause, and then in a sincere voice, his last words to the entire crew were these, Friends, it's been a long trip. Welcome home. Because of the way he said it, we all welled up and fought back tears. I wiped my eyes as I reflected in that moment about all the uncertainty that had come with the journey all the sloppy sailing, and how little I knew. But none of that mattered now because we had completed the race. I've always kind of thought that heaven might be kind of a similar experience. I read somewhere in the Bible that there is a book of life. I don't think this book of life is full of equations, and I don't think that it's just a list of names either. I think that this book of life is more like a book of lives, a book of stories. I bet it's about people traveling in the direction of Jesus, trying to follow him. People like me who made lots of mistakes and mid-course corrections. It's about people who stayed within the large circle of his love and grace, staying the course on a long line pointing toward him. And their names weren't in the book because of what they did or didn't do. They were in there because of who God is and what he has done to draw a circle around them. After we each cross the finish line in our lives, I imagine it like floating into the Hawaiian marina when our names were announced one by one. And at the end, perhaps simple words spoken by a loving and proud God will be, friends, it's been a long trip. Welcome home. Make no mistake about it. 
We're pilgrims on this earth. We won't be here forever. As a matter of fact, the Bible says this earth will not be here forever. Imagine that. All the things you've worked so hard to accumulate will be left behind for others. And then one day will be no more. Heaven's on the horizon. We're headed there. We're headed to eternity. For those who have simply trusted Jesus and taken him at his word, we will step into a land that is fairer than day one day. For those who refuse him, I am so sad to say, it will be nothing but suffering forevermore. Whatever plans you're making for vacation, for education, for career, for retirement, please don't fail to plan for eternity. And it's true. Like this little boat zigzagging across the Pacific toward Diamond Head, if I could go back and trace my steps, it would be a crooked line that has gotten me from where I was to where I am and to where I'm going. And one day I was listening to a song. It's been a few years back now. And the guy singing said, Lord, hold on to me. Because sometimes I have a hard time holding on to you. Lord, hold on to me. Would you just quiet your soul in this moment? Would you just humbly Would you just humbly say, "Father, I don't know how I'm going to get to where I am to where you want me to be." But please, please take my life in your hands and bring me to that moment when I'll hear you say, I know it's been a long trip. I know there were times when you wondered if you would ever get home. I know there were days when you wondered if you survive the onslaught of life. But you're here now. Welcome home. Lord, this morning, I pray that we would give priority to the spiritual side of our existence, that we would not be so engaged in worldly affairs that we forget about how important it is to follow the star that you've put in the sky for us. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. Lord, help us to know that on any given day, it's not what we do, but it's what you're doing that is leading us home. Help us to be more mindful of your presence. Help us to be more surrendered to your plans for us. 
Help us to be willing to let go of anything that has become a drag to our journey. Lord, just speak to us this morning about things eternal as we consider this, this word that you have given us. Because one day, the marketplace will be empty, and there will be no more traffic in the streets, and all the builders' tools will be silent, and there will be no more time to do our work. Lord, help us not to dread that day, but help us to long for that day as we make you the Savior and the Lord of our lives. And it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Here I am waiting.